our fall climate change conversation series. It's being co-sponsored by our colleagues at Harvard Alumni Travel. And we are both very pleased to feature a number of speakers who have connections to Yale and to Harvard, as well as distinguished faculty and speakers from both universities. Together, we have organized nine discussions for our collective alumni communities. Each discussion features experts across a wide range of topics relevant to climate change. All of the lectures are being recorded and are available to view afterwards on the Yale Alumni Academy and the Harvard Alumni Travel website. So if you miss one or if you didn't see the first two in the series, which took place this week, please do check back on our website. You can find the recordings there. The next conversation will be held on Tuesday, November 2nd from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern and will feature Professor Jim Salzman, who is an alum of both Yale and Harvard. Today, our featured guest is Gernot Laganda, who is Director of the Climate Change and Disaster Risk Reduction Programs at the United Nations World Food Program. He supports the WFP country offices and the governments they serve to understand the effects of climate change on food security to develop strategic actions to reduce climate risks in country programs and to make innovative climate finance instruments work for vulnerable communities. Gernot joined WFP from the International Fund for Agricultural Development, where he managed the world's largest climate change adaption program for small, uh, smallholder farms. He's a geoscientist by training, and he has spent the past 20 years working at the nexus between disasters and documentation, holding posts with both NGOs supporting disaster relief and reconstruction projects in places like Afghanistan and Tajikistan, serving as humanitarian program specialist with the Austrian Development Agency, and managing climate and environmental programs with the United Nations Development Program in South Africa and in the Asia Pacific region. Garnot holds a master's in applied geosciences as well as a master's in public policy and postgraduate diplomas in disaster management and international development cooperation. So with all of those distinguished accomplishments, you can certainly understand why he was chosen in 2016 as a Maurice R. Greenberg World Fellow, which is a program housed at Yale University's Jackson Institute. Welcome, Kurnot. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Lauren, uh, for the kind introduction. It's great being here. Um, I want to start maybe with a quick um, a quick vignette here um, about the news. Who, if you're following the news, you will know that in two days, one of the largest ever climate change conferences is going to start in Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, as humanitarians um, concerned with the safety and the well being of the most vulnerable people on the planet who are uh, at the brink of food crisis, we are of course, going into this conversation with a very strong message that the climate crisis is a humanitarian crisis. And I would like to uh, share my screen now to show you a few um, introductory visuals that illustrate this. Uh, the very first cartoon here from The Economist depicts a little bit what many people in the humanitarian community believe will be in stock over the next years and decades. Right now, the world is fighting with the coronavirus, with a global pandemic, but eventually in one, two years with the vaccines and with the medical de developments, there will be um, protection against the coronavirus. While in the wings waiting, we have a much bigger opponent. And this, um, climate crisis waiting in the wings is really already happening in real time. This is nothing that is going to happen 10, 20, 30 years in the future. It is very real. It is affecting people right now. 
And this is also one of the messages that humanitarians all over the world will be bringing to the climate talks in, in, in Glasgow. Um, why do we worry about climate change? So what is the link between climate change and food security? Um, the real discussion around the human impact on the global climate has started in the 90s. Uh, the very first climate change conference was launched in 1995 in Germany. <clears throat> but I would say the international humanitarian space uh, that is concerned with saving lives after disasters, after conflicts, after natural disasters, uh, has for Ernest recognized climate change as a threat in 2007. This was also when you had a seminal report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. You had this uh, documentary by Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth, and you had a Nobel Peace Prize awarded to, uh, to Al Gore and the IPCC about the messaging about the climate crisis. And I, I would say that many development and humanitarian agencies have at that point realized that climate change is not an environmental issue, that it affects all sectors of the economy, public works, agriculture, that it, it creates sea level rise, that it will affect the land use planning, it will affect um, the economies relying on climate sensitive natural resources. And from there on, I think we have, we have started to work on what we would call climate risk management or climate change adaptation. More recently, 2019, you know, like the scientist here on the on the on the bottom right corner, one might think that you know the the penny should have dropped that um, the climate crisis is real, also because of the hunger numbers we see on the world. So as the world's biggest humanitarian organization concerned with food security, we are concerned about hunger in the world. And we look at the climate crisis through the prism of food security. And as you can see here from these statistics, which are taken from uh, the status of food insecurity report 2021, um, hunger numbers have been on the decline for most part of uh, the, the 21st century, with exception of the past five to six years where we saw a trend reversal. And when I press another button here that shows you where we are right now on hunger numbers. 28th of October, we stand at 879 million people in the world who do not have enough to eat. So when you look at the shape of this curve, we're going clearly in the wrong direction. We are not going to what the sustainable development goals have enshrined as a global target, zero hunger by 2030, we're going in the wrong direction and effectively reversing development gains, going back in time uh, to about where we were already more than 20 years ago. So this is the dynamic. The drivers behind this trend reversal are three. One is conflict. There are many more man-made conflicts in the world today. The second one is climate, climate extremes, climate shocks and stresses. And the third one is economic inequality, economic recessions, the last big ones are the ones we see in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And these three drivers, they combine to create a very toxic environment uh, that plunges many people into a food crisis. Now, when we look at the impacts of climate change on food security, then we see a number of effects. The first one is that we see more frequent climate extremes. 90% of all natural hazards that create disasters are climate related. And when you compare uh, the number of reported disasters in the past two decades, which is the lower, uh, the lower line of, of circles here, with the ones on in the previous two decades, then we see that the number of disasters, and that includes uh, climate disasters, has almost doubled. The number of fatalities has not increased to the same extent, mostly because early warning systems around the world have improved a lot, including in developing countries such as Bangladesh, for example. Uh, but overall, the number of affected people has increased, the economic losses after disasters have increased, and this is basically in the wake of more frequent and more extreme climate events. 
when you look now how these disasters distribute globally, then you see certain countries, including um, China and India, account for almost 70% of all losses and damages and affected people um, in the past two decades. But when you normalize this over population of 100,000 people, then you see other countries pop up as those countries with the most affected percentage of the population. For example, Lesotho, Somalia, Zimbabwe. So it's a different group. Only Philippines is present in both groups. Uh, this means that when it comes to food insecurity and humanitarian operations, our map looks slightly different uh, in terms of climate impacts than when we look at uh, the issue globally uh, and with a view of absolute figures. Uh, also, an, a new element to the problem is that certain hazards are picking up speed more than others. We see in, in, on average, we see all climate-related problems uh, increase quite a bit. Uh, we see droughts increase, especially floods increase more than, more than double. But we see especially heat waves becoming a new threat for many people, and I think also in the US, in Europe, uh, these heat waves are hitting very hard. They bring climate change to the doorstep of many people and um, help them associate with the topic and also in terms of relating to people who live um, on, on the other side of the world uh, with fewer resources. Uh, for example, less shelter available, less water available to cool down. But extreme temperatures and wildfires are two of the, uh, the threats in the humanitarian perspective that we didn't have on the map that much in the past. And now they become extremely damaging and extremely difficult in terms of, of response. But we are not only concerned about the extreme events. I think these extreme events are something that is very often uh, also well reported in the media, storms, droughts, and floods, uh, up to the point, I think, where even a certain fatigue with that, um, with that kind of messaging sets in. Another set of problems is not the shocks, but it's the stresses. So those are creeping problems that affect people's livelihoods. And they range from melting of glaciers, which over the short term provides too much water when you don't need it, and over the long term, too little water when you need it, to erosion, salinity in soils and groundwater, more heat stress in crops and in livestock, uh, pest infestations that we weren't used to, and also rising sea levels and ocean acidity that tends to, um, that tends to break the, the buffer uh, capacity of coral reefs. So these small disruptions, they don't make it into the news. Uh, they are creeping problems, but they make people much more vulnerable. So if you are confronted with many of these pressures in your livelihood, then even a smaller disruption can push you into a food crisis. Another impact that is very important when it comes to climate change is its link with displacement and social tensions. Uh, climate impacts displace people. And when people get displaced, then they get in contact with other people. And when these other people are already under pressure themselves, we see social tensions break out and, and conflict. It can also be conflict over scarce natural resources. This can be between different livelihood groups in, in one country, for example, between farmers and herders who both need water for their livelihoods. Farmers need it for the crops, the herders need it for their, their animals. Uh, or it can happen between countries, for example, along the Nile or along the Mekong, these big transboundary river basins um, that provide water for irrigation and for agriculture to countries all along these river basins. Basically, a country upstream is taking a lot of the water out, and the countries downstream do not have sufficient uh, water for their own agriculture, and that creates tensions also along these river basins between countries. But this um, effect of climate impacts on displacement and climate impacts on social tensions is very important. When you look into the statistics of 2020, then you see that climate extremes have displaced 
around 30 million people from their homes. Those are what we call internally displaced people. That means people that do not cross borders, but that get displaced in the countries they live in. And in 2020, this number was three times higher than the number of people displaced by conflict and violence. So the, this donut here in the center of the graph, the blue yellow one, the blue part is the number of people displaced by weather related disasters and the yellow one is the number of people displaced by conflict and violence. And when you project that into the future, the latest study that I have seen from the World Bank projects that by 2050, we would have 216 million people displaced each year. That is around seven times as many as we see today. So this is people displaced by climate extremes and happy to share also the study later on. I should also mention in this point that climatic changes do not evolve in a linear fashion. It's not that the, the temperature keeps increasing steadily. It's a bit more like you can hit certain thresholds where then all of a sudden the global climate tips into a different state. So these abrupt and irreversible changes in the global climate system are possible as early as between one and two degrees of warming above pre-industrial averages. And right now we are already in the red zone here with 1.1 degrees global average warming above pre-industrial averages. So we are right now <clears throat> in tipping point territory. And what, what could that mean? It could mean that, for example, the permafrost is thawing and releasing a lot of methane which itself is a very potent greenhouse gas, and that would then accelerate the degree of global warming. Or you see big ice sheets melt, and what has previously been the white surface reflecting a lot of radiation back into, into space is turning into a black surface absorbing more of that radiation. That also turns um, the climate into an accelerated state of warming. Uh, and who is interested in the concept of tipping points, I can recommend a, a, a Netflix documentary that was done uh, together with one of the partners of WFP, the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. Also, David Attenborough is, is narrating on this. It's called Breaking Boundaries that shows a little bit how this tipping point concept works. Lastly, finally, I want to mention that um, whenever there are political discussions about whether climate change is real or, or climate change is not and what causes it. There are also uh, resources out there from the insurance industry, from the military that show very clearly that climate change is already recognized as a massive security issue. This is uh, from a report, the World Climate and Security Report, uh, published by the International Military Council on Climate and Security, it says all segments of society, including militaries all over the world, are concerned about the catastrophic risks of changing climate. The time is to act in a way that's commensurate to those risks. So there is a responsibility to prepare and, and to prevent. So there is really a very strong problem statement here. Now, we, we understand what climate change is doing to food security. We know there are gonna be more shocks. We know there are going to be more stresses. So we are massively concerned. The question is, what can we do? I mean, the, the past model of responding to climate extremes has been to wait for disasters to happen, then mobilize resources, assess the damage and come and try to save lives. But with the scale of change, with the scale of impact, um, we are really hitting a wall here between the humanitarian needs that are rising much faster than the resources that are available. So this is the picture um, that presents itself to us. Uh, you see two lines here. There is a red line, which is the funding required to meet humanitarian needs every year in WFP. This is not the global humanitarian budget. This is basically the acutely food insecure people that WFP supports. So this is a constantly rising line. 
And then you see a blue line. This is the confirmed contributions to WFP's budget. And you see this line rise as well, but you see it rise not in the same uh, step. That means it is opening a gap that right now is around 50% between the needs we have and the funding we receive in order to meet these needs. And in the future, this is becoming bigger. This gap is only going to increase. The blue line is flattening out because many donor governments, many countries have COVID response in their own countries. They're concerned with their own unemployment and the fiscal stimulus packages, they go basically back into the home economies. Uh, at the same time, climate change doesn't stop. It, it continues to be a risk multiplier for conflicts, for economic recessions, and the, the, the red line continues to increase. So this is our, our biggest problem here. And if this continues in the future, the question is, how can we collectively bring that gap closer together again? For us, the solution consists in two things. The first one is depart from an ex post approach to humanitarian aid. That means waiting until people are in trouble and responding only then is not going to be sufficient in a changing climate. We need to work with different kinds of programs that invest in systems that reduce humanitarian needs of the future. And I'm going to get a little bit into now what three examples for these systems are. In essence, we need to not only wait for disasters to happen, we need to start working in a more anticipatory, more preventive fashion. And there are three examples that I would now like to get into. The first approach is to work with nature rather than against it. Strengthening nature-based solutions, working with what we call ecosystem-based adaptation solutions. WFP has a long track record in what we would call cash for work or food for work programs. So during the lean season, when many households go hungry because the crops have not yet fertilized and you do not yet have a harvest, we work with large numbers of food insecure people on programs, communal development programs. And many of these programs are nowadays focused on natural buffer zones against climate extremes. So we're talking about terracing, slopes that are prone to slipping. We're talking about more communal ponds and water points in places where we need to store more water for longer dry periods. We're talking about hedgerows in fields, green belts, mangrove green belts um, along the coastlines in order to uh, protect against storm surges, trap sediment in order to build these, these natural barriers nature-based adaptation solutions. We also work with food insecure communities in exchange for small transfers to meet their daily food needs. So a cash transfer or food transfer, talking two to three dollars a day, in exchange for their engagement in larger protective in infrastructure programs. That means flood and landslide protection, um, flood revetments, um, drainage in, in places where we have more flooding, improved storage facilities to keep the harvest in there uh, longer. And we do that also after the disasters have happened where, where usually you have this opportunity to rebuild destroyed infrastructure and you try to rebuild better than uh, in the way it was before. So nature-based solutions. In this segment, we try to also couple a number of complementary services. One is, access to climate information. For, for people in, in, in OECD countries, it's very natural to turn on the radio or the TV and you see the weather forecast for the weekend. For the most smallholder farmers in developing countries who actually rely on this kind of information um, for their livelihoods, because if the harvest does not uh, produce, then the family goes hungry. These folks do not have access to the same uh, degree of information. So we try to couple our work on nature-based solutions also with access to weather information. And we try to slot in renewable energy solutions because if you produce food 
you need to also prepare the food. And if you do not have fuel sources to heat the kettle that you need in order to boil the beans or, or the rice, then you have no other choices left than to go back out in the landscape and, and chop down the trees. So coupling nature-based solutions with climate information, with renewable energy solutions is from our perspective, a very good climate change adaptation investment at community level. Lastly, um, an important complementary investment um, in the humanitarian space over the last five years or so is financial protection. So we try to create communal savings schemes, which are then buffer capital for times of uncertainty or times of smaller crisis. And for the larger crisis, so the more catastrophic events that do not happen that often, we try to make climate risk insurance work for smallholder farmers. We also, in doing so, strengthen access of smallholders to financial services, which they normally do not have. So the, the headline here is creating buffer capital for nasty surprises. And if you then have a, um, an approach or a package in a program that deals with natural capital, with access to financial capital, financial protection, access to information, then these are the, 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 the capitals or the assets that households need in order to become more resilient to a more uncertain and hostile climate. So this is one example, integrated resilience projects that have at the core nature-based uh, solutions. A second example that is becoming more and more relevant and important in the humanitarian space is to not wait until a disaster strikes. Our headline on this is predict and protect. Uh, and this is the way it works. The current humanitarian model starts from a climate disaster, then we have our humanitarian professionals going to the field very, very fast after this disaster has happened. Um, that is the same for earthquakes and climate disasters, by the way. Um, assessing needs, figuring out which groups need which kind of support, planning and prioritizing our support, raising an appeal, mobilizing finance, and then delivering aid. Depending on the disaster, depending on the country, depending on the context, this chain can take up to four months. The new model of working, or the one that we want to get to, is we already have investments in stronger forecasting and early warning systems at country level. We already, before things happen, establish plans on what we do, who does what, NGOs, government, WFP, the UN, who does what, in the case of an early warning system triggering a hazardous, uh, a hazardous signal. We also have pre-positioned finance, and that finance then gets released before the disaster strikes. And we have a few examples on how this has worked in the field. Interestingly, at the height of COVID, where it was really difficult to go into the field and to, to get access to our target groups, in July 2020, when uh, communities in Bangladesh were confronted with an extremely strong monsoon season, we managed to transfer $54 per household to 30,000 households, around 145,000 people, four days before a flood on the Jamuna River. With, these, with this capital, which is around a month's salary for most households, families evacuated livestock, they bought essential supplies as long as the markets were still open, food, medicine, they bought building materials to protect and reinforce their shelters. And as a result, in the impact assessment, we saw that our support was available up to 100 days earlier than a traditional humanitarian response that would have come later after the villages were already flooded. We also saw that households were more than a third less likely to go a day without eating during the flood. And also importantly, the cost of our emergency response operation was reduced by 50%. So this is not only more efficient and more empowering to people than receiving handouts after a disaster, it is also economically viable. And this is also an argument that helps you bring that needs line down, right? So this is money you do not need to raise. 
as grants for humanitarian response because you caught it early. And if you save a dollar by investing a dollar, then basically the uh, humanitarian funding gap can be closed. Again, this is a bit more detailed for, for those of you who are interested. Uh, we compared basically the, the return on investment for acting early with acting after 2017. Um, we reached 105,000 people at a cost per beneficiary of 23 US dollars, 2019, $27 per beneficiary, and the anticipatory action uh, used 13 US dollars per beneficiary. So it's really cutting the cost of the emergency response in half by acting early. And the last example that I want to leave you with um, on how the humanitarian sector is dealing with the climate crisis is about protection of people with financial safety nets. Essentially, what we're talking about here is climate risk insurance, making climate risk insurance work for poor smallholder farmers, which are traditionally not on the radar of most insurance companies. There are two models for climate risk insurance. The first one is microinsurance, where a smallholder farmer is holding the insurance policy. Second model is macro insurance where a government or a humanitarian agency is holding an insurance policy. The first one is already going a little bit into the direction of what I have discussed before when we talked about nature-based solutions. It's the integration of risk reduction investments, for example, tree planting, terracing, integration of that with insurance, with communal savings schemes and access to credit. And the interesting model here that is very attractive also for the insurance industry is that when we work with food insecure populations, we transfer not only food or vouchers in exchange for people's engagement in these large communal risk reduction projects, we also transfer insurance. So people work with us for two months on a big terracing or land restoration project, they add 10 extra days, then they get to hold in climate risk insurance policy for the next season. And in doing so, we can get insurance to a scale that is normally not possible if you need to work village by village and strengthen the, the demand side in, in places where insurance is not yet part of the risk management spectrum. So this is microinsurance. The interesting part here is the integration with other resilience investments. And the macroinsurance uh, part of the equation is where governments are insuring themselves a bit against catastrophic risk. And there, the, the latest innovation that you will come across is regional risk pools where different countries basically share their risk, buying into one insurance pool and taking out insurance policies from that. The biggest regional risk pool is the African Risk Capacity, also called ARC, and WFP is supporting a program that is called ARC Replica. So the idea here is, Countries buy insurance coverage against drought disasters and humanitarians replicate this, this insurance purchase. And in doing so, they basically negotiate the product together, governments and humanitarians, and they decide what to do with a payout in case this insurance triggers. In 2020, WFP has protected 1.3 million people in the Sahel mostly, Mali, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, the Gambia, but also Zimbabwe with ARC replica policies. And right now we see a big ARC replica payout in Mali. So based on an insurance premium of around 1.5 million US dollars, the insurance now pays out uh, over 4.4 and that feeds into an early humanitarian response. Also that is funding that we do not need to raise from donors as grants. It's funding that comes basically through a private sector driven risk transfer instrument. These are the three examples I wanted uh, to share with you. I know it's probably um, um, a, bit, a bit much at times. Um, the important thing for us is that none of these solutions work if they are not integrated in a programmatic and strategic fashion. In our case, um, in a country strategy or a country is they always consider the time before the disaster, which here is on the left-hand side, where we are dealing with risk reduction and prevention efforts, different levels, 
government level, household level, where we try to work with smallholders to diversify production because more diversified production is also more resilient than monocropping, uh, where we try to intensify nature-based protection, um, where we work with protective infrastructure. So the examples that I have given before are outlined here in red font. And as we go through the disaster cycle, basically having a hazard here, um, a hazard event um, in, in, in red, uh, then we can crowd in anticipate reaction, early warning, disaster prevention, getting our stockpiles ready. And at the point of the disaster, we see then the payouts of the insurance schemes uh, or our contingency finance mechanisms. And then after the disaster, we try to build back better. Uh, we try to make sure that the investment that usually follows after a climate disaster, this phase is used well in order to strengthen the recovery and build back in a more resilient fashion than uh, the infrastructure was before. So these are, I think the, this is the impulse I wanted to give into the conversation. Um, and um, if you want to know more about climate action programs in the World Food Program, please uh, take a look at some of the resources that we have put up right now. Actually, it's a really good time uh, to follow because COP26 is just two days away and there are a lot of interesting, very relevant resources about climate action, not only from WFP, but also from our partners in the UN system, from UNICEF, from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, from the Red Cross system. And they usually uh, contain a wealth of data, a wealth of information, uh, but maybe my one takeaway message, if I can make one is please consider the climate, the climate crisis is a humanitarian crisis. It's not something that is going to happen in, in 10 or 20 years from now. It's playing out in real time. And there are solutions that help communities. We need to bring these to scale and we need to do so quickly in order to avoid a runaway scenario. So with that, um, back over to you. And I look forward to um, hopefully many questions. Thank you. Thank you, Granat. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I hear you okay, yes. Okay, great. Um, so if you have questions, would you please do us the kind favor of putting your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen? That allows me to keep track of everything that was asked and answered. I know there were a couple of questions that have already come in. So I'm gonna start with, um, well, actually, I'm going to start with my own. It's one of the benefits of hosting these. Uh, you, you spoke about this being uh, the climate change crisis being a humanitarian crisis. And I think you've really illustrated very well the ways in which displacement and food insecurity are some of the main factors in the humanitarian crisis um, that emerges out of climate change. But I, I wonder if... Um, you could speak a bit more about how that impacts the developed world. Because I think you, you made this small point about during COVID, money that would have gone to donations um, has sort of been redirected into um, inward looking economic investment. And uh, at the same time, we've seen in the COVID crisis that what happens elsewhere in the world impacts all of us, not just the people living in a particular country. So I think more than any other time in recent history, we can see the way in which there's an inter interdependency between the welfare of the developed world and the welfare of the developing world. So I, I would love for you to say a bit more about why these things, why preventing these humanitarian crises should matter to those of us living in the developed world, aside from the sort of altruistic humanitarian perspective. This is a really good uh, start to the, to, the question, uh, to the questions round. Let me take a crack at this. I think, you know, when you look at what we have learned from COVID, then we have learned a number of very, very important things. I think the first thing we've learned is our societies are not as resilient as we think they are when it comes to globalized threats, globalized risks. And like COVID, 
the climate crisis is a globalized crisis. What happens on the other side of the world matters to your climate. Um, what you have on your plate and eat, the carbon footprint of that matters to the weather outside of your window. If you throw food away, that matters. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter after uh, the US and China. So there are, there is, I think, growing recognition that globalized problems are affecting everybody. And the climate crisis as a risk multiplier, of course, has an impact on many different problem lines all around the world, from biodiversity to the way we grow our food, to the way people move across the planet. Again, when it comes to displacement, uh, to my mind, I'm always making a difference between migration, which is more of a choice and a, a voluntary choice, and also, to my mind, a, a legitimate adaptation strategy, because if you cannot do your farming any longer in the plot that gets hit by drought after drought or in a, play, in a plot that is now plagued with salinity and pest infestations, you need to migrate, you need to move, you need to feed your family somehow, right? So there is migration and then there's forced displacement, which is basically you don't want to move. And most people do not want to move from, uh, from their countries, but yet they get uprooted, especially by, by climate extremes. And when they get uprooted, then there is another, another dynamic there. They get basically in touch with others that can generate conflict and conflict is then the driver that basically creates these spillover effects uh, across borders. And that then also affects Europe, it affects the US. Just, um, I think, um, to illustrate the story for the US, in the dry corridor of Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, we had a, I would say, the perfect storm of, of, of problems. We had years of dry conditions that have basically um, knocked out the staple crop harvests. And then we had the biggest, strongest Atlantic hurricane season on record that came on top of that. And you had COVID come on top of that. As a result, we have around 8 million people on the move because they cannot make a living together with their families in these places that have nothing to eat. The food prices are shooting through the roof. The little food that is still there is way too expensive for people to access it. You have destroyed infrastructure because you had two storms, Eta and Iota, that came in November very quickly in very quick succession, which is also something that, that this climate induced because normally, you know, the storms that happen once every five or 10 years, now all of a sudden you can have two of them in just two months. But just to illustrate, you know, these things, they affect the US as much as Europe because it is a risk multiplier, it is globalized, and it can only be tackled with globalized solutions. Oh, that's a really wonderful explanation. Um, thank you for that. And, and so interesting to think about the interconnectedness of all these different factors. Uh, I want to go to Gary's question. Gary says, climate change deniers I have spoken to deny the science data, deny that humans are responsible for uh, climate change, and therefore that they can mitigate the problem. How would you speak to people like this? Um, P.S. These are relatively uh, well-off people here in the U.S. who are personally, or who, he says, who are personally unaffected by climate change. But I would argue that everyone here in the U.S. is affected by climate change, whether you realize it or not. So they feel that they are unaffected by climate change. How would you speak to them about um, the science? Yeah, it's also an excellent question. I think. In the, in the US, the issue is very polarized also because there are many studies being commissioned from many different directions. And so I, I usually do not get into the weeds of different studies telling people different things. Um, there are certain, you could call them vital signs of our planet that are observable. You can go and touch that impact. You can see a picture of a glacier in the Himalaya 10, 20 years ago and now. You can see, you can measure the temperature of the ocean water. You can measure the dimension of the Arctic sea ice. So what, what I'm getting to is that the impacts that we see with our own eyes that are evident, 
you do not need to you do not need a theory about what causes climate change or what doesn't it's sufficient to know that this is happening it is happening fast and it is happening in real time it is affecting the us so for example looking into california and the wildfires looking at the statistics how often how big these wildfires are looking at the colorado river drying up looking at the droughts in the midwest looking at the flooded subway stations in new york city looking at the impact of the hurricane season looking at the numbers of loss and damage or also the part of the budget the national budget that has to be used in order to clean up after these disasters these statistics i think are are convincing uh, in and of themselves and again you do not need to get into the, the whole debate about greenhouse gas emissions and emission reductions um, you can just let the facts and the, the impacts speak the clear language that they have unfortunately started to speak by now um, but this is this is I, I think one approach uh, just to not get into a protracted conversation um, and and leave the the um, the evidence on the table because we can measure it's it's very evident that's a great answer and certainly i mean many of these things are things that have never happened before in 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 history so you can't really argue with um, the first time for the magnitude of such disasters um gary says thank you that was an excellent response uh there is let's go to amy's question there's work going on at the arava institute for environmental studies among other places on agriculture in hyper arid environments how would this type of work fit in with helping people with food insecurity in climate challenged arid environments i'll tell you that um on our our first climate change presentation we had two days ago we had someone who really wanted to know about reversing uh the sahara desert and making it um, you know, changing the climate there so that it was land that could be used for um, for food and et cetera. So this kind of question about arid environments, I think it's being tossed around a lot in these conversations. Yeah, also really good question. And there is one one thing here when we look at the Sahara and and the Sahel zone, right? Many people have the Sahel in mind as a as a very dry uh, a landscape, which which it certainly is, it has always been battleground between um, men and the desert. Uh, but we had, um, I think, also when you look at the climate projections, you see on average more rainfall in the Sahel in the future. And so people think, oh, this is an automatic uh, greening response here. We have more rainfall. This is better. The problem with that rainfall is that it doesn't fall the way that uh, smallholder farmers would need it in order to undertake agriculture. It's essentially longer dry periods with much drier bone dry ground. And then you have very heavy, very intense deluge type rainfall <clears throat> that then really does not infiltrate, that washes all the, the, the topsoil that's left away. So on average, it might be more. But because it falls in such intense bursts and after longer dry periods, it is very damaging to agriculture and, and infrastructure. So there is, first of all, I would say um, a contextual factor here, uh, understanding what aridity in this particular, which timeline you're looking at uh, when you try to uh, reverse land degradation, for example. So this is one thing. The, the second one, I think there is space for innovation in climate change adaptation. In many of the, the places we work with, you do not need to work with high tech. You can basically start with indigenous traditional know-how that maybe has already been lost in parts of the country, but that still exists in some other pockets there. And this is also a very interesting observation because many people move out of agriculture, certain parts of certain countries, vulnerable countries, are now devoid of that indigenous knowledge, while in other parts that are still holding their ground, this knowledge is still there. So there is transferable indigenous knowledge that is, I think, very important, has the same space um, as, as more technological innovation. But the trick is in combining this traditional knowledge with then what also, also science brings to the table, like hydroponics, for example, 
especially in displacement settings, in refugee camps. There are um, innovations out there. I should at this point add here that WFP is running an innovation accelerator in Munich. So there is a program out there and there are basically um, regular calls for innovations. All the innovations that are relevant for food security, um, research groups, small enterprises can submit them and there are pitch nights and basically the, the winning innovations then get developed and an opportunity to scale them and field test them in a WFP operation around the world. So that is an interesting uh, opportunity, I think, for everyone who thinks that they have a climate food security relevant uh, innovation that they would be interested to present or to pitch. It's a Munich Innovation Accelerator. And then I'm going to also, um, I think, um, if I have an opportunity here after the event, post the link in the in the chat so that you can access it. And we'll we'll put the link on our uh, on our web page where this recording will be accessible as well. So it's great that you highlight that. Certainly, Yaleys and Harvard alum are are very competitive in such um, e events. So I would love to see some innovations coming out of our universities. Uh, I want to go to Carol's question because you you talked about smallholder farms, um, and just to focus on them for a minute, she says it would be interesting to hear if, as part of your early action plans, uh, you hope to secure land and property rights for small um, holders, or to collect data about housing, land, and property rights to reduce conflict and smooth possible return. Here's the mute button. Land rights, access to land is, of course, a big, big issue underpinning social tensions, conflicts. I would not connect them with the anticipatory action topic, because ultimately, when it comes to, to anticipatory action, you just want to get early warning information and early support out to people who are in harm's way no matter where they sit. If there is basically a hotspot, a flood plain, a flood zone, uh, you know there are 10, 20,000 people or families living there. You want to get that support there before they get hit by disaster. So you are not immediately concerned with, at this point in time, uh, the land use uh, plans or access to land rights. However, uh, when it comes to nature-based solutions, this is an exceedingly important element. Uh, and if people do not feel they have the right to land, then there is, of course, also no incentive to take care of the land, right? There is evidence that people, when they have and they own a plot, they maintain their trees, they maintain the vegetation, they nurture the land, they safeguard the biodiversity. Whereas when they don't, then basically it's fair game, right? If there you can go out into a, a, a landscape and chop down the trees for your firewood back home. So it is an element that makes people more vulnerable. I think it is an element of resilience, especially when you do not have political capital, when you do not have access to decision making, that makes a household more vulnerable. And so whenever we consider well-rounded integrated resilience programs, and it's not only access to natural capital, access to productive capital, to know how to information, it's also access to a political voice, access to decision making. So I would very much agree with you that this is an issue that needs to be considered. Um, I should maybe add that not every organization is equally strong or punchy in this space. So partnerships between humanitarian development advocacy groups uh, is, is very, very important in order to basically come to these well-rounded interventions that also use the strength of civil society, combine it with the proficiency of the risk managers and the humanitarians, and then the larger investment plans uh, that also international financial institutions can bring to the table. I'm glad that you brought up public policy because uh, we have a, a few people um, asking about that in the chat, uh, Fred and Yannick. Welcome, Yannick. I've seen you on a few other um, 
presentations, always really interesting perspective that you add. She's the executive director of the Haitian Renaissance Institute in New Haven, and, um, and really bringing up the issue of political advocacy and the fact that when the vulnerability um, of these populations, smallholder farmers, people who are potentially going to be displaced, gets exposed through a climate change disaster or a humanitarian crisis of any sort, it gives the opportunity for authoritarian regimes to take rise. Um, it destabilizes existing political structures. And Fred in particular is asking, um, you know, how can those structures be, you, you talk about sort of preventatively shoring up uh, the, the communities with funding and, and planning. How does that planning and funding apply to looking at the political stability, shoring that up in advance of crises? I would answer that we work in 80 countries and they are all in very different situations. There are the fully fledged conflict contexts, Yemen, for example, where you have war, protracted war over several years. The interventions there are very much protection focused. You need access. You need to negotiate also in Afghanistan with the Taliban, making sure you can get access to the population that requires humanitarian assistance. It's the same in Yemen. So access, protection of civilians, maintaining basically the humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, um, and getting to the people who need support in order to, to save lives. There's a big cluster of those countries. Unfortunately, uh, the number of countries that are in, in these situations are growing. Then there are countries that are in what you would call a post-disaster phase, in a recovery or rehabilitation period. It can be after a civil war, or it can be after uh, a, a big uh, storm disaster or flood disaster. Haiti is a particular case because there you have such a, a frequent and potent intersection of different crises that it is one of the most fragile settings that, that we have to work in, right? It's not in a, Haiti is almost in a permanent loop of, of disasters. Maybe, maybe I get to Haiti later, but just to, to conclude. So there's the post, uh, the post disaster reconstruction uh, phase. There you have some opportunities to rebuild in a different way, better than before, right? Everything is, is, is destroyed, everything emerging from the rubble. You will have certain difficulties like no access to data. You have lost a lot of the, the important uh, uh, data that you need to do research uh, or, or, or targeting, but you can rebuild. And there are certain types of programs that help uh, communities rebuild. Then you have settings that are very much displacement focused. Uh, so basically countries bordering uh, conflict zones, you have a lot of displaced populations that creates a very um, specific set of interventions that we require. People on the move are especially vulnerable uh, also to, to all kinds of shocks, you know, from violence to to recruitment by, by, by militia to um, climate impacts. And then you have the more, I would say, development type settings. And even there, you have a distinction between the least developed countries where you also have very often um, civil servants who are not paid well, high levels of, of corruption. Of course, not always, you cannot never generalize, but there is usually much bigger problems than in middle income countries where you have stronger capacities and generally a bit more institutional framework to work with. So whenever it now comes to the engagement at the, at the political or policy level, then of course, the easiest part is to work in middle income countries because there you have this existing institutional framework and the national policies that are being uh, devised be it climate policies or disaster risk reduction policies or development plans, usually they have some continuity. There is a connectivity between the national level, the regional level, and the local level. While then when you go into maybe least developed countries, that connectivity is starting to break, right? So you cannot automatically have a conversation at the capital and then assume that at the district level, that conversation will have left a trace, 
So the more broken the governance systems are, the more our conversations are taking place at the grassroots level. And the, again, if you have these 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 um, disasters that play, are playing out in real time, then very often, apart from our negotiations on access and protection for the most vulnerable, we tend to work with community groups and 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 more the informal sector to to get things done. So when it comes to these nature-based solutions, we just go to the to the grassroots, work with local community groups, um, strengthen those. While in middle-income countries, for example, in Asia or Latin America, we work through the government and try to also strengthen government systems to better serve people, bring better early warning information to people, and to basically working more in in that um, public policy type, the rational public policy cycle. Really fascinating, and I, I um, note that a few people have raised their hands. I don't know if you're raising your hand by accident or if you have a question, but if you have a question, please do put it in the Q&A box, and I think we'll probably have time to get to all the questions. Um, I, I actually want to bring up a topic, um, Gerdonot, since you you, you mentioned sort of early warning systems and um, when we were talking a little bit before we started about your um, background in Germany. So I'm compelled to bring up the flooding in Germany and, um, and the early warning system there and how it worked slash didn't work um, depending on the communities. And, and I do that because we're talking about people in the developing world, but so many of the issues that you talk about are also relevant for the developed world, especially when it comes to planning and prevention and nature-based solutions. Um, so I, I know there are a number of people on the, on the presentation today who um, work in fields here in the US that could benefit from taking these ideas and strategies and applying them at home. And I just wonder if you could speak about that, um, particularly in light of the flooding in Germany. Yeah, so basically following the flooding in Germany, I should I should maybe add I'm from Austria. Uh, I was born and raised in Austria. So south of the German border, we speak uh, we speak German uh, as well. And of course, you know, during summer where I also was home with my family, we followed uh, the, the floods in Germany closely. And I also checked in with some colleagues who um, knew a little bit more about um, the emergency services there. And there were there was this big question, I think, also. Um, with the government, why uh, no one saw that coming or that um, that heavy impact coming? Um, and I think there are maybe a few uh, ways to, to 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 slice this. The first one is the degree of heaviness of this event was something that basically most people have never seen in their lifetimes. This is this is something that climate change does. A once every 100 year event, all of a sudden, boom, comes once every five years, 10 years. I just looked also, by the way, this is a little tangent now, but it's very similar, Madagascar. In Madagascar, we had the 2019, 2020 drop. This is an event that normally happens once every 150 years or so. And the last one of a similar size has happened in the early 1990s. And also now, a once in a, you know, once every two generation event, turns into twice a generation event. And in Germany, Germany, it was similar. So the scale of that impact was just nothing the, the system was prepared for. The second one is also, um, I think when, when, whenever there is um, a, a, a civil alert system, it requires um, a, a bit of you know, forecast accuracy. No? And normally the, the weather services, the med services in Europe in Germany, you know, they're among the best in the world, but that thing came so hard and so fast uh, that you knew there would be rain, but then how heavy the rain would become, um, you could get out an early warning, very only very close to the uh, very close to the event, maybe two, uh, three days or so. And many people thought, okay, this is going to be a heavy rain, so I'm going to close my shutters, but that this would rip away. Um, uh, infrastructure and, and, and roads and, and cars, nobody, nobody really had that in their memory. This is why I think the prevention or the, the preparedness was, I would say, the basic level of preparedness that people took against a storm and heavy rainfall, but not going beyond what you had always done in similar events, right? And, you know, rather, 
I mean, if this event would have required people to evacuate, leave everything behind and get out of Dodge, right? And it's, it's just until you're at that point, never having experienced impacts like this, I mean, just think about whether you would be in a position to do that, even though they say, now this is really, you know, above average, please make sure, you know, that you are safe, uh, don't go on the straight. But uh, yeah, it just caught people cold footed. And it, it's the same now with many events in the US with the wildfires, uh, with, the, with, the, um, with, the, with the storms, even though there's also, I think this culture of preparedness is now being ramped up. And these are all stories, I think, um, that are helping all of us to, to become a little bit more, I would say, empathic with people on the other side of the world who do not have that same degree of early warning, the same degree of protection. And also one, one aspect with the German floods that I find very interesting is the floods in Germany, they have been all over the media. They were really, really capturing the new cycle in Europe for, for a long time. When you look at the same time into similar type events playing out all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, in the dry corridor, that is not the same degree of, of attention, even though you know there are human lives here, human lives there. It's like we have all collectively become so used to uh, negative stories from uh, from other parts of the world that you know we don't listen that closely anymore and it's something that I think is our collective responsibility to to break open again um, and and again as as bad as these disasters are that happen in Europe and that happen in the US I think they they generate more awareness in people's minds that these things are real they happen to everybody every country every sector of every economy is affected nobody is safe from this and it's not something that is happening on the other side of the world so there is always uh, i think also that dimension that is that is relevant here and how the media reports on it that is big too thank you uh, that's exactly why i asked the question because i i think when people hear the kinds of topics that you're talking about we think about places like Africa and uh, you know Asia and so forth, where these disasters strike and you just see the poverty made so much worse. But we don't think about the fact that they're happening at home and make those connections, um, as I think you've so eloquently just done. And also, I want to apologize if I seem to imply that Austria and Germany were the same place, although they are near each other, they are very different places. And I've visited both. and. Um, Austria is a, is a place that you should go to if you have not been. I know we also do have some Germans, um, or some people in Germany on the, on the session today. So I did want to ask about that because I know some people feel um, that it is close to home for them. No problem with the United Nations. We're basically cosmopolitan. <laughs> um, so we do have a few more questions before we finish. Um, and I want to go to uh, this question about payouts for climate change impacts. You know, as we look at these events happening all over the world more frequently, um, someone wants to know why are insurance companies willing to provide coverage um, to, they ask particularly about African countries, but I think it can be implied for, for anywhere. We know that these events are going to happen. What motivates the insurance companies to be willing to to set themselves up for a payout in the future? Yeah, the insurance companies. I mean, many African countries have insurance companies. They start from a different corner. No, Bangladesh, for example. I remember this was life insurance that that started it all. And then you know, over the years, new products came into being, and all of a sudden, you had a very vibrant microfinance and microinsurance landscape. And it's similar in, in African countries too. So where there is demand and usually, you know, some type of insurance starts to, to take a foothold and then new products come into being. The problem with insurance is um, the microinsurance part has a supply and a demand side problem in developing countries. So on the supply side, there is generally two few products that compete with each other. And that means that the premiums are still prohibitive and high. On the demand side, you have the problem that uh, many people do not yet 
understand the, the functioning of that instrument and you have also have many people who are hard to reach or who are not literate or who are not financially literate. So there is a demand side, there's no demand side pull and then there is no competition that would make the products fit for, for that, that, that market. So when now insurance companies work with us, then they see the advantage that we have this reach into these very remote settings because WFP has a, a very, very strong field presence. In the last corner of the most difficult country, you will find a WFP feeding center. You will find a sub office. So working with the, the rural population positions us in a sense to work on the demand side, especially when we put part of the humanitarian assistance into an insurance premium. But what we also then need to do is to negotiate with the insurance company that this product is low priced. And one argument that brings the insurance companies to offer such products is that we also work with the local communities on risk reduction activities. That means it's not that we ask the insurance companies to now insure somebody who is sitting uh, in a very flimsy shack in a floodplain. We have done our work with flood protection, building the revetments, building the drainage, building strong shelters, building strong infrastructure, which then reduces what insurance companies call the basis risk. And that then gets them to also lower the premiums. So there is really a demand side and a supply side angle to this. Um, again, in every context, it's different. Insurance is not a solution you can apply in each and every context, also in post-conflict or, or post-disaster settings, it's not a good idea. But especially in the middle-income countries, insurance is already, a, a, you know, a, I think, a recognized tool to manage risk. And when you then go into that whole idea of regional risk pools, where, for example, in the African Union, 30 to 40 countries pool their risks in a joint instrument that is an African-owned insurance agency for African countries, this is a completely different kettle of fish because then this is a more, I would say, policy-driven um, regional risk management instruments that also has political buy-in from the African countries. And, and because it has that buy-in, the insurance product is much more, I would say, um, established, well-established. And it's not, you do not need to work on the, on the demand side as much because you do not need to work with each and every individual household to enable that they have experience with these instruments over a certain amount of time, but you can work directly at the, at the national level. People come at this or, or countries come at this from the, at the perspective of fiscal resilience. Basically, what, how do we protect our own economy, our fiscal structure against these climate extremes? So there are, again, context specific and then you need to always consider is it is it micro insurance for for smallholders or is it macro insurance for governments but the products are out there it's just about making them work in different in different settings so it's really <clears throat> having that full circle approach that you showed us in your presentation as well you know the prevention as well as the what happens after the disaster. Um, I want to shift to uh, Lisa's question about agricultural monoculture in the US. For example, patent corn. How does that affect food insecurity worldwide? Okay, so this is a, of course also a, a loaded question. I mean, I, I probably would come at this from the perspective of food systems. So the systems that produce our food and bring it to our tables generate around 30% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, it's a big, big piece. So how can you make these food systems or how can you structure or transform these food systems in a way that they A, remain productive or even increase productivity because there will be more people on the planet uh, tomorrow. So we need more productive food systems. How can they be more resilient? That means how do they not get knocked out by these increasing climate impacts? And then third, how can they be low carbon and not contribute as much as they do at the moment to global warming and to greenhouse gas emissions? And again, there are different agricultural systems. When you look at the uh, US system, it's a highly intensified system. So it is not very resilient in terms of climate impacts. So when you, for example, have only maize and only one type of maize, 
maize is a very heat sensitive crop that gets knocked out quickly if you have especially longer, very hot peaks. If you do not intercrop with other crops or if you do not, um, if you do not have rice varieties that are more drought resilient, then you are in a very, I would say, precarious position. But it's also an expensive proposition because these intensified plots, these large intensified plots, they require a lot of energy input, they require a lot of water. And in the end, it's, I think, an, an economic argument is there to be made that uh, shifting to more efficient water management, to more efficient energy management, on these larger farms is an economic necessity. And then of course it has very, very positive environmental impacts. So I would say monocropping is not a resilient approach. Um, it is prone to being impacted by global warming. So there is a, it's a riskier proposition than a more diversified approach to agriculture. And it is also quite expensive in terms of the resource intensity. Um, so that's one, one angle here. Of course, uh, I think the question was only about crops or was it about livestock production as well? Um, it did not- It wasn't, uh, but I think, I think okay. it an answer to go there, yeah. No, I mean, with, I, I was just about to say, you know, with, with, with livestock production, it's very similar, no? So there are two types of, of livestock production as the intensive type and the extensive type. And the intensive type is the really damaging one. This is where you have these big feedlots where basically cattle by cattle um, is, is, is on very, very, um, very little space. You have um, fodder come in um, from usually from, from soy plantations that have been created after chopping down the trees. That is the type of intensive farming that has a massive, massive carbon footprint and a massive environmental footprint. And, but you can shift basically from this kind of farming to extensive farming where you rotate the grazing, you know, where you basically use your cattle, you put them on certain plots out in the open and then you let them rotate. And after they have rotated over, over a number of days from one plot to the next, that plot on which the cattle have grazed almost got a natural, a natural peeling, you know, like a natural rejuvenation, you know, the hoofs and the, and, and the dung there they regenerate the, the soil. And then, you know, from plot to plot, you can basically manage a very healthy uh, stock of, 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 of cattle in a way that is not as damaging to the environment. And that also provides a very high quality beef. So there is, you will not basically hear me say that you should stop all meat eating altogether, even though of course that would have a massive impact on global warming. But I think, um, having a more in incremental approach to changing our diets is also very, very important. And, and considering that also uh, meat is an important protein source for, for many people. It's just about making choices. No? The first choice is, should it be red meat or, or white meat or fish? You know, the red meat is of course the one with the highest uh, resource intensity and carbon footprint. So if you have the choice, maybe go for a lower uh, a lower level uh, meat source, or then if you want to stay within the meat, then try to see whether it comes from an intensive or a more extensively grown grown source and go more for the one that is extensively grown. But maybe I'm getting a bit too much into the <laughs> into the well, diet well, question. You know, people do ask these questions, yeah. you know, which meat should I order? And, and I think what yeah. you're saying is we want to order the grazed meat or the grass fed yeah, but if you can if you can really maybe reduce the beef consumption that already makes a big difference so, and, and and then if it has to be beef go with the extensively farm okay uh i want to um get to a question that someone asked because we're talking about what people can do on an individual level um and someone asked if if they if i was a person of means I had, you know, wealth that I could, I could conceivably do something. What would the best way be to impact these systems and programs that address food insecurity and the climate crisis? There are, I think, there are always ways uh, to to contribute. I mean, for for whichever means you have, right? Um, if you have no means. Be aware of what you have on your plate, how your own actions affect the environment. But if you have um, 
basically some capital to invest and you want to, to, to change the world a little bit more, then I think there are one effective way to invest, to my mind, is to strengthen institutions in developing countries that basically group uh, farmers and, and um, yeah, strengthen community-based institutions in developing countries or uh, student groups in developing countries, universities in developing countries. I know we're talking, you know, most of the participants here are Yale and Harvard graduates, right? So there is probably a tendency to, you know, to give back to your alma mater and to, to, to fund your alma mater and, and, and understandably so. But keep in mind that there are many universities in the countries that we serve from Bangladesh to, to Zimbabwe to Mozambique. There are groups there that deal with these questions. What works on climate change adaptation? What can we do? How can we protect our farmers? Strengthening these groups, I think, um, investing in the research that then has an impact pathway directly where you support it I think that is also a, a really smart idea. Um, it's often difficult to find out, you know, who is doing what, what kind of research is going to have the biggest bang for the buck. There are also, I think, international networks out there that, that can guide a little bit in that direction. What are the, um, the university networks? I have, for example, I'm, I'm connected with quite a few of them. There is in Bangladesh, there's a university um, that is training young people from developing countries on climate action, climate mitigation, climate adaptation. People go there from all over the world, from Latin America, from Africa uh, to Bangladesh. They get their degree in climate action. They go back to their home countries. They try to make a difference there. This is, I think, a, a really important way to, to support in the countries that have these problems. Really excellent answer. Um, I want to just, I have two more questions outstanding. And I think before we can wrap, um, Deborah wanted just to know quickly if you advocate regenerative agriculture. Yes, yeah, regenerative agriculture, ecological agriculture, it's a very resilient system. It depends a little bit also on the context again, but in general, regenerative ecological agriculture is something that we have seen work in the field and we try to support it wherever we can. And uh, Kestutsa, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name right, but it, it's a tricky one. Kestutis uh, wants to know, uh, 1.8 billion people live in the equatorial zone and uh, climate change will make that area uninhabitable. What can be done to deal with the migrations of people that have already started and will inevitably get worse? Uh, that is, you know, for the for the end of the session, you know, with with only two minutes left, that is the you 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 okay, save okay. the best for last. <laughs> but okay, so big migratory movements, you know, you can see them, you can see them happen. And again, you know, these numbers, two hundred and sixteen. A thousand people displaced by 2050, seven times as many as today. It won't, I, I don't think the whole Equatorian belt will be displaced in the next or in our lifetime. But there will be big migratory movements and we need to be ready for a number of things. The first one is people on the move are vulnerable. We need to basically find ways of supporting them, shielding them, making sure that they are not exploited, making sure that there is a system that that doesn't consider them as uh, a threat or unwanted. This is basically something that um, I think is a collective ethical, it's a moral responsibility to treat people who were forced from their homes uh, through extreme events as you know, in an emergency situation and support them accordingly. So there is, there is I think this, this the perspective on people on the move, that's important. We also need to understand that the bulk of displacement is still happening internally. And I have not seen that dynamic change. So when you take that, uh, all the internally displaced people right now around, I think uh, 40 million, we have around 70 million in total. So we're talking, you know, about not, not, not quite 50, 60, 60, 40. So 60% of people that are displaced are internally displaced. And this is also because people on, on the one side, they do not want to, to leave their homes 
it's it's just you know if they can if they have a way to stay many of them try to do that so there is if you have for example a safety net if the government has basically a contingency fund or they have you have an insurance uh, solution that pays out after you got hit by something you have something to start again if you don't have that there is nothing that that you can do i mean you you need to feed your family you need to get uh, on the move so safety nets i think is is very important um because it it helps people um always have something to work with always innovate in their own livelihoods uh, even if you need to get out of agriculture you can maybe become i don't know bicycle repairsman motorcycle repairsman there are there are people are shifting in in between livelihood strategies and there is a high degree of innovation also in that in that movement so social safety nets to my mind are important and lastly there is this permanent pressure on natural resources i think land restoration you know and keeping that restoration going not not ever saying okay this is a country that that we give up on i think it's a permanent uh, a permanent need to work with ecosystems also consider that these ecosystems will change you know that that species will migrate but keep the landscapes alive keep them diversified invest in permanent regeneration of degraded landscapes it's a great investment because these are multiple benefit investments if you plant uh, the right kinds of trees in, in in degraded settings it's not only erosion control uh, it's not only after a few years um, fruit from the tree it's also carbon sequestration it's flood protection um, and it also has regenerative value for people as well so there is a there is and cultural value so there is you know, these multiple benefit solutions to my mind that are provided through through nature-based approaches they need to be kept on you know a low flame you know always as part of uh, the landscape uh, perspective that we have in the most vulnerable countries including in the equatorial belt well impressive answer for the last question of the session uh garnot laganda director of the climate and disaster risk reduction programs at the united nations world food program thank you so much for joining us this was an excellent conversation many compliments to you in the chat uh from a very uh passionate and captivated audience and we hope to see you again with the Yale Alumni Academy. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Lauren, and regards to everybody. Okay, bye-bye.